Hello, everybody. Justin Stivers. Thank you guys for, for tuning in and listening for another episode of The Stivers Show. Very excited about my, uh, the guest today, Brent McLaughlin, uh, Executive Director with, with Branches. Um, I'm going to let him explain all they do, but, but needless to say, they're doing a lot of uh, awesome things in the community. D despite uh, COVID, they're still marching forward and, and doing, you know, providing a lot of great services to the community out there. I know they just on the tail end of a, a back to school bash and, and uh, helping all the little ones get get ready in whatever form form they can i don't know what the school year is going to be like it's going to be <laughs> bizarre but um and and we're t i want to talk about you know you you have an um, annual thanksgiving uh meal drive that you all do so we'll definitely touch on that but um brent first and foremost thank you for for being here man and uh welcome to the show and uh what i always like to start is you know who are you and, and what do you do okay well, thank you, Justin. I appreciate the invitation. It's, it's good to connect with you and be able to share a little bit. So, um, so I have been serving here as executive director now for over 19 years. And so it's been quite a tenure that You're nobody, right. <laughs> <laughs> including myself, could not imagine that um, I'd be here for so long. But it's, I'm blessed, though, with the opportunity. And I I originally started professionally in a homeless rescue mission in Peoria, Illinois. And from there, my wife and I went to Haiti in the mid nineties. And from after three years of doing, working in development there, international development, we ended up landing here in Miami. And so after five years of doing something else here in Miami, it made a lot of connections. And this opening, um, I was approached by some people actually through the United Methodist Church and really said they thought I'd be a good fit. Well, at the time, the organization was a half-time person and then the full-time executive director. So there were just two people. And it was a very tiny little back office operation that was trying to work in communities, but it was located in a church building in East Little Havana. And I looked at this and I thought, wow, we got a lot of work to do here. So, so with a, a, a very modest budget, um, kind of went out and started talking it up. But before that, really said, how can we create value in the community? And um, what, where is going to be our distinctive? And so what we focused on were two key areas. One was student achievement and providing enrichment and really long-term relationships with students of all ages, from kindergarten all the way in post-secondary education. And then the other area is around financial wellness and really helping families that are in poverty or, or have experienced generational poverty to find avenues and opportunities to begin to grow and build out of that. One, through education, but two, through building better habits and, and really financial capability. Um, how, did, how do you improve your credit, for example? And to really help people get the tools to do that, not do it for them, but to help them kind of work through those pieces. And usually that involves reducing debt, starting savings, and, and kind of going from there. And the next thing you know, people can get on a solid footing, but sometimes they just need a, a partner to, to work with them. And, and that's where we come in. And so we built around those two areas of focus and um, just to put it in context, we went from a $100,000 budget to today we're around a $4.3 million budget. And obviously it's not about the money, it's ultimately about the impact, but the money and the resources and the people that come with that have enabled us to really make uh, outsized impacts beyond even my wildest visions, to be honest. Um, and I had a pretty big vision when I first came, but you know, it keeps, just keeps on going kind of thing. And that's the and the reason for that though is is all the people that have come around and have become part of branches, and I'm just you know ultimately gratified for that because it takes all of us to really make a big impact in people's lives and in the community. That's 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 very impressive. I, I so who's is the founder still involved or? So the organization was founded in 1973 by actually the United Methodist Churches in Southeast Florida. And so when it was founded, it was really like a volunteer operation. And if you can imagine 73 coming out of the 60s, a lot of social unrest and the, the, the way that they started very tiny was a telephone uh, tree type thing for homebound elderly folks. 
that was apparently the need of the day. And I think about the 60s, I actually did a little research and realized that the, the largest demographic in poverty were senior citizens in the 60s. We don't realize that. But that's part of the reason why the war on poverty with Lyndon Johnson um, started was because we had sort of not taken care of elderly people in this country. And it was like 20 some percent were living in poverty. And so as a result, that's how they started. And then from there, it, they kind of morphed. And the organization for about 20 years was an advocacy organization responding to crises such as the Liberty City riots. Um, and then eventually the Haitian refugee crisis, and then it came Hurricane Andrew in the early 90s. Responded wholeheartedly, but by about 97, 98 is when they started realizing, okay, what's next? And at the time, finally, Miami area was actually a little bit stable. And so in that stability, Miami Urban Ministries, that was the name of the organization, was kind of without a compass at the time. They didn't know quite what to do. So they decided to do some strategic planning, and that's when they came up with the vision of, and the plan, I guess you could say, was let's go into communities of poverty, let's be a presence, a long-term presence, and a partner with, with neighborhoods and, and people and their, in their lives. And so that's what we've done, and where we've landed is Florida City, where Hurricane Andrew hit, we stayed down there. And then South Miami, which there's a neighborhood called Marshall Williamson neighborhood. And we are, have been there for over a decade now. And then up near North Miami, we're in unincorporated Miami-Dade County, but it's called Lakeview neighborhood. And we're looking at two other neighborhoods, but I'll kind of keep those under the wraps right now because that's a couple of years in the making. So. Gotcha, okay. And, and where's, the, where's the name Branches from? So in the, the work after Hurricane Andrew, the program that got started was with kids, and it was to basically give them a sense of grounding and, and purpose in the midst of the disaster because everything had just been kind of ripped out from underneath them. And so the, the person who came down as part of the relief effort, her name is Kim Torres. Believe it or not, 25 years later, she's still here. 26 years later, she's um, down there, and she's our director of student services. So she started this tiny little operation with, with uh, day one, uh, no kids came to the program. <laughs> so she had zero kids and she was like, okay, I'm, I'm not doing something right. So she kind of started going door to door. Um, and the next day, I think she had a handful of kids. By the end of that first week, there were 50 kids. And so she had to pick a name. And because she had come down through the United Methodist Church, she picked Branches Outreach. And, you know, I've asked her before, why did you pick branches? Well, she had been an elementary education major, and she said, I thought trees were going to be easy to draw. <laughs> so I'm going to be branches like a tree. And then the other thing is, though, she also picked it from Scripture. Um, there's a passage in the book of John, John 15, 5, and, it's a, and Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And she kind of liked that idea of that we're all the branches out in the world making a difference. Um, but we're connected to the the cent central part, which that was that was the Lord. So interesting, interesting. And so, is it still it's still a part of of the church, or is it separate from 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 the church? So, so in the 1981, actually, they formed it as a separate nonprofit. In '73, they started it, and it was part of the church. And then they kind of separated it as a nonprofit. And so today, we have a board of directors that represents all sectors of our community. Um, however, in our bylaws, we do have a, a percentage, um, of, it's about half of the board that we want to come from the United Methodist Church. And then the other half of the board, it's a goal. It doesn't always, sometimes we dip a little below that, but for the most part, we have Methodist lay members and usually one or two clergy that's remained part of the board. And I will say that we get support uh, from the United Methodist Church as an institution. Um, in fact, that's our two main sites right now here in North Miami and then down in Florida City are both on property that's owned by the United Methodist Church. But what we've done is created community centers on these nice. properties. Nice. So, so the two, you know, kind of areas that you kind of focus in on, if I heard you correctly, is, is younger children in general and then 
the, the portion teaching financial literacy? Is that older kids or, or who falls into that category? Well, that's a good question because over the years, what we learned was we, we first focused the financial aspect to adults, basically. So it was parents of the children or in our neighborhoods or for the whole community. So by 2009, quite honestly, we had started doing financial education back in 2003. The recession hit. And then all of a sudden, after the, what, 08, 09 recession, everybody was talking about financial literacy and education. Well, we had been doing it at that point for six or seven years. And so we were selected by the United Way to operate the United Way Center for Financial Stability, which is a financial coaching model. And so that has been a huge opportunity you know, for us. And I think the United Way has been very satisfied with the results that we've had. And obviously, it raised the profile of the organization uh, quite a bit to be connected that way. And so I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. But what we've learned, and we just did this two or three years ago, is that, hey, if we're doing this with the parents, why aren't we doing the same at a, diff at a similar scale, but in age-appropriate ways for the kids? And so about three years ago, we started creating a curriculum based on lots of information that's out there and we kind of pulled it together and, and made grade level specific workshops for the kids. So now all the students at branches and today we have over 450 students go through year after year, they're, they're getting input and um, lessons around finances and what it means to navigate that and be in control um, as you grow year after year. And so by the time the kids get into high school and they're starting to make plans for college, trust me, it's, it's pretty amazing to see how their thinking has just completely been transformed. Even though they may be growing up in circumstances of low wealth and not have many resources themselves, now they understand the concept of, of saving and the value of that and also the potential of compound interest and, and on and on it goes to all the way to the point that we've had our high school students say, okay, you've taught us all these things. We want to learn about the stock market. You know, we want to learn about financial markets. And so we've been teaching about stocks, you know, and what, how you invest and what that means and, you know, the, uh, how to be smart about doing it and not just be a risk taker and think you're going to win kind of thing. It's not a lottery, you know? So, so it's, it's kept evolving and growing to the point that we're, um, it's transformative, quite honestly, to help people really get to that point of saying, yes, this makes sense, I can do this. So we do a college simulation with our juniors and seniors in high school. We have a, it's like a two hour simulation that we created where what's it like in your first few months of college? Well, at the heart of it is how to manage your finances now that you're independent, you know, you have room and board, you have different sources of money from scholarships and grants to financial aid. How are you going to manage all that and do it well? You have your tuition, you know, you want to make sure all these things get paid. So through it all, some of the kids, you know, run out of money. Um, some of them actually save money. And that's the thing. The ones who are saving then talk about their experience to the others and say, well, this is how I did it. And it's a lot of fun. And they have to go from station to station and do all these different things. But in the end, they really learn a lot and it gets them prepared to go off to college and, and manage that well. What we had learned prior to was our own students who were going to college, too many of them were actually dropping out. And that kind of taught us that we need to prepare them better so that they can really persist and succeed. Because it is one of our, I guess you could say, uh, downfalls here in our society is that lower income students who go on to higher education Believe it or not, only about 15% graduate, ultimately. So that's 85% are not sticking with it. And the number one reason is not able to manage their personal finances, believe it or not. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. They've already made it over the hump to get to college and then to, to, not, to not finish. Right. Yeah. That's, so does the, the program that you're teaching, you know, that, that you, you guys are, are doing, leading, is that in conjunction with that with the schools? Is that an after school program? How do how do people get involved in it? How do the students get involved? So we we are after school, um, and so and we 
But one thing that we've always said is we're not an after school pro or we're not a daycare program and we're not just an after school program. Yeah. So when kids come in, they realize this is a commitment and we have a waiting list at all three of our sites, a long waiting list. And they know that if they need to show up and be engaged to keep their place um, at branches, because otherwise we have lots of other students. And one of the things that we have developed over the last six, seven years is a scholarship program as well. So one of our goals is that students will graduate from post-secondary education debt-free. And so, our scholarship has been growing. Now it's up to 3,000 a year, so 12,000 over a four year. Uh, but we keep, we're building on it. We have future plans to try to endow it so that we can long term, you know, currently we have 42 students who are receiving the scholarship right now across, across America, actually. We have them from Oklahoma all the way up to Yale, and then here, many in the state of Florida. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um, I, I got to ask, you know, obviously with with COVID and, and all of that, how's that how's that affected your all's, your all's programming? So it was uh, the Friday afternoon that the Miami Public Schools announced that there would not be classes this back in March on Monday and then for one week and then the next week was going to be spring break. So there were two weeks of no school. canceled and then after that they said they'd make a decision and we by Friday evening I was on the phone with Kim our director of student services and we were making plans what are we going to do you know we, we can't just close up and, and wait um, even though at the time when we think back it seems like several years ago but it was just six months or five months ago but you know we were there was a lot of uncertainty and we just didn't know how do we navigate this by Sunday after Noon, I had all our directors on a conference call this is before before I was using zoom <laughs> but um, we were all on that conference call and I said I want to be open Monday morning I said not open in the traditional sense but how can we still connect with people how can we continue to serve people and sure enough uh, you know we had our team at home but everything went remote and so except one thing we did all our services remote, so financial coaching, tax prep, we were figuring all this out as we were going. And then we were connecting with the students, helping them with their re remote learning. But what we did do is we also started to providing meals for families, especially those families that were losing their jobs or some of their paycheck was being eroded. And so we started doing drive-through meals. To date, we've now, uh, at two of our, uh, three of our sites, we've provided over 29,000 meals. So, and that's with a lot of partners. It's not just branches, but branches is facilitating it and getting it out to the people that need it. Uh, Feeding South Florida has been a fantastic partner. Uh, the National Christian Foundation has actually partnered with us quite a bit. Sushi Maki has been a big partner. They provided a lot of meals. Um, and we've got, there's been donors that have supported that and paid Isn't Sushi giving Maki. Out sushi? What's that? They're giving out sushi? Uh, they've made it more like, you know, rice and stuff. <laughs> they haven't actually done it. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the owner, um, Abe Ning, he is just a fantastic guy. And um, he's been eager to do that. So honestly, together, we've provided a couple or 3,000 meals just through them. That's awesome. Well, I, I've got I've got a ton of questions, but I know we're, we're short on time. And, and um, so I, I did want to get to... You, you Thanksgiving drive, and we were talking a little bit about that before. I think that's one of your your you know annual one of the main events that that you all do. So maybe share a little bit about what you got because I know you're doing a little bit different this year. But um, how can you know? Are you looking for volunteers? How can people get involved and in, in all that? So you know the heat index. I think two days ago was like 105 degrees. So it's very difficult <laughs> to be thinking about Thanksgiving right now. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, but It'll be here soon. <laughs> It'll be here soon. And, and then the heat index will only be 88 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> like that, right? so, so with that in mind, knowing that it's probably far out of people's range of thinking, we are, we traditionally we've done a Thanksgiving meal delivery where between 4,000 and 7,000 meals a year, we, provide, we prepare them that morning and then deliver them out across the community to families in need. 
Well, this year we know that we can't necessarily do that because we normally have 800 volunteers across seven or eight sites that come. Most of them are congregational sites. People come in and help us prepare, assemble, and then move them out the door and volunteers take those meals out the door. So we're gonna do a little bit different this year. Rather than doing food drives at the beginning and then getting all our volunteers to come prepare the food, what we're gonna do is purchase all the food so we're, we are gonna be in need of increased uh, financial donations for that. And then we're probably going to connect with some commercial kitchens, you know, some like Sushi Maki, for example. We still need to reach out and talk to some of them, but find a few that are willing to do a couple of thousand meals each and then pay them probably, because you know, that's a huge undertaking. We realize we can't probably get it for free, but we will try to you know, maybe negotiate a discount or something provide all the food to them, then take the, the food to our sites Thanksgiving morning, have it delivered in right then, and have some volunteers there to put them in bags. But, you know, at a given site, we may have 200 volunteers in the past. Well, we know we can only probably have 20 volunteers this year. So we'll stay socially distanced, get people to put those together, and then volunteer drivers will come through and it'll just be a drive-through pickup of the meals. We'll put those meals in their cars, give them the addresses where to deliver them, and then they can take them out to the community late morning, early afternoon, and we'll still, I think, be able to accomplish our goal of, of meeting the unmet needs here in the community on Thanksgiving uh, Day. So that's our hope, that's our aspiration, and we're gonna be in September sending out more information in years past, just to give you a sense, because this has become an annual tradition, this is going to be our 19th year, we, will, we would post in September or early October the volunteer uh, sign-up online. And I kid you not, within a week, we would have nearly 1,000 volunteers signed up. Like People are waiting for that to come out. So this year it's going to be tricky because we, we cannot host that many volunteers. Um, it's been a tradition for a lot of folks. A lot of families come out. A lot of children come and participate in it. But this year, um, honestly, it's going to be a fraction of that, I think. I mean, maybe with all the drivers needed, we still may incorporate up to maybe 400 volunteers or so at the max. But it's going to be drastically redu reduced. So for those folks that want to participate, you know, be in touch with us. Um, that's going to be critical because it's going to go pretty quickly. Yeah. Spaces are. Well, if anything, you guys are uh, adapting very well. <laughs> or, oh, thank you. I mean, it's, 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 it's impressive. I mean, you all, and, and I mean, really everyone right now who's, who's, you know, kind of trying to adapt to this new norm, it's, it's got everyone changing, you know, changing the norm, I guess. Well, you know, so it's very impressive. Um, you know, la last question for you is, you know, so you're obviously, you're doing something right, right? Not only are you all, you know, helping just a tremendous amount of people and, and a lot of people in need, which is fantastic, um, but you're doing it on a pretty big scale too. And you've grown, you know, I, I would say somewhat exponentially from when you started 19 years ago in the, you know, I know it wasn't a dungeon, but a, a small room to, to, to where you all are now. What, what do you think, you know, you kind of attribute to, because there's a ton of, you know, there's a, there's no, there's a lot of organizations out there that, you know, want to give back and want to do things, but they never really achieve that scale, right? They never, you know, they, or, or they tend to stay at a, a, a smaller level. And it sounds like you all are, are growing, continuing to grow. Your aspirations are, are big. What do you think's kind of been the, the key for your all success and to draw the community in to, to engage them? Because like you said, it, it takes a village, you know, to, to get it done. So that's another uh, really good question. So <laughs> I, I would say, um, Part of my philosophy when I first came was, I, quite honestly, I, I felt called to the work. Um, and I have always, I've always been in kind of the nonprofit sector. And one of the things, I'm just gonna be honest with you, Justin, and whoever might listen or watch, but one of the things that I had noticed over the years was, unfortunately, I saw too much mediocrity in our sector. And that was disappointing to me uh, because I truly believe that what we do and we work with humans and their development, it's not a transaction. It can't be, and it needs to be transformational. And the only way you can get to that 
is through relationships and by connecting. And that takes time. And it's not always the most cost effective, you know, if you're going to work that way. And so I committed myself years ago that any work that I was going to do was going to be based on that foundation. And even if it didn't grow that much, that's okay, because I want to do it right and I want to do it well. And so as I came in, one of the lessons that I've learned is if you truly create value that matters and value that's durable and value that people can say, I, I believe in this, what ends up happening is it attracts resources. Now, yes, you have to figure out how to share that word and get it out there. Um, and I always kind of had in the back of my mind in those early days that I wanted to work harder than the next organization, you know, so I admit it, I'm a little bit of a, probably not a little bit, if you talk to my wife, you find the true story, but I'm a bit of a, a, a workaholic. Yeah, you, <laughs> so, you, and, you and me both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I so, get and, and you know, we should talk more about that someday. Yeah. So I've got, I've got further uh, feedback on that because I think if I were doing it over, I would try to do it a little bit differently because, <laughs> you know, you make sacrifices and sometimes the sacrifices, when you look back on them, go, hmm, was that the right sacrifice, you know? Yeah. But, but I do think overall trying to make that balance, though, that's a critical part, too, of success, I think. But at the end of the day, it's all been about value. How do we add value to people? And so when people recognize the value, what happens is it just starts to, starts to exponentially grow. Um, and I think if you continue to focus on that, it continues to grow. Like focus on the right things, not the wrong things. So one of the things that I've always done has been very critical about dollars that we chase after or receive. You know, we're looking for things that fit our mission, not that are gonna take us off our mission. And it's very easy in the nonprofit sector to chase dollars. It is too easy, trust me. I've told people before, honestly, we could be a $15 million organization, but I'm not gonna go chase those dollars because it would have taken us way off our, our mission. And when I say some of that, I'm referring to, for example, large government contracts. They're out there <laughs> and they're seven figure contracts, but they're not what we do, you know? And if they're not gonna create a contract that is what we do, then we've learned over the years. It's just like financial education with, with children in kindergarten. That took us some years to learn how to do that and why we should do it. But now if I can't, if there's not a government contract to pay me to do uh, financial education for kindergartners and first graders and second graders, then I'm not going to worry about that. And I'm going to find other ways to support that rather than to, to morph for what they've got a contract for that I should be doing with kindergarten. If that makes sense. Yes, yeah, well, hundred percent. I, I, I'm in my head. I'm, I'm thinking about the clients that I've accepted and I should not have accepted. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I want this money and I, I can help you, but I just know I don't want to do it. And, and so now I've gotten better about that myself. So I, I definitely understand. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, Brent, I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. I thank you again for being on here. Love the, love the work you all are, are doing. Um, I know probably people listening and or watching um, will want to learn more about you all and, and find ways to, to get involved. So do you all have social media, contact? How, how, can, how can people best get in, uh, in contact with you all? Yes, so our, our handle, boy, I should know these things better. This is where I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> but our handle is branchesfl. So, and our website is branchesfl.org. So I, I'm pretty sure our handle works on Instagram and Facebook and, and other places. But um, yeah, that's, that's like the quickest way to, to find us. Our logo has a tree and a uh, building, a city building behind it. And it's green and white are the colors. So you can't miss it once you see it and kind of identify it. So. It's got branches in it. So it's got branches. <laughs> awesome. Brent, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. Thank you guys for, uh, for watching and listening and I'll talk to y'all soon.